This lecture begins with solving perhaps the first physical problem to have been addressed and solved, that is answering the following question. What is the geometrical shape of the Earth? Okay, the Earth is spherical. Now, it's actually not quite spherical. It actually bulges a little bit at the equator as it rotates. The Earth's equatorial radius is just over 20 kilometers greater than the Earth's polar radius. Now, that difference of 20 kilometers is minimal compared to the average radius of the Earth itself. So essentially, for all practical purposes, the Earth is spherical. Okay, well, now, how do we know this? Well, there are some subtle visual clues around you, such that you can easily understand that the Earth is not flat. For example, the existence of the horizon. Okay, here in Pacific Palisades, you have a couple of nice opportunities available to you, such that you can easily see the Earth's horizon. For example, let's say you go down to the beach here in Pacific Palisades and you look out over Santa Monica Bay. Let's say that you look down towards the airport. If you look down towards the airport, that distance from here is maybe about five or six miles or so. It's just enough to be able to easily see the existence of the horizon. For example, sometimes docked, off, docked offshore just south of the airport, that is near the town of El Segundo, every now and then you'll see some oil tankers. If you look at those oil tankers carefully, however, from here in Pacific Palisades, you'll notice that you can't quite see the entire portion of the boat that's actually above the waterline. A portion of the boat is actually below the horizon. Okay, here's what I mean. Let me draw a simple diagram to illustrate. So begin by, for example, assuming that you're really close to the oil tanker. Okay, so I have this specific example of oil tankers in Santa Monica Bay. Let's begin by saying that you're really close to the oil tanker. Okay, now if you're close to the oil tanker, you are then going to be able to see the following. Okay, this right here is what is referred to as the water line. Now let's say right here is my rather poor rendition of an oil tanker. And you can see this point right here where the hull of the ship meets the water line. So you can see this. Okay, now for example, let's say that you are facing the ship and then you start walking backwards. As you walk backwards while facing the ship, what would you see? You would see two things. First of all, of course, the ship would get smaller because you're getting further and further away from it. But in addition to that, it will appear to sink below the horizon, such that you do get far enough away from the ship that it is no longer in view. For example, let me draw that out like so. Okay, so now further away. Okay, when I draw this line right here, this line right here no longer represents the water line. Instead, it's the horizon. And then let's say that here's the oil tanker, like so. So number one, I've drawn it smaller because you're further away. But in addition to that, you can no longer see this point right here, whereas you could earlier, this point right here where the hull met the water line. This portion of the boat, for example, is now below the horizon. Here's another example of the horizon that you could easily see here from Pacific Palisades. Once again, go down to the beach here in Pacific Palisades, let's say it's a nice clear day, and you look towards the south-southeast. If you do, you'll see Catalina Island. Catalina Island is maybe 35 miles or so from us here in Pacific Palisades. When you look at the island, however, from the beach here in Pacific Palisades, you see what appears to be two land masses that are separated by water. You see two hills, for example, that appear to be separated by water. The situation looks like this. Okay, so now, as another example, 
we have Kettling Island. As seen from Pacific Palisades. Okay, first you go down to the beach here in Pacific Palisades, you then see the following. Okay, now when I draw this line right here, this is now the horizon. And then you see what appear to be two hills. Here's a hill here on the left and the hill here on the right. What appears to be two land masses that are separated by water. However, those two land masses there are actually a single land mass. They're connected by a small strip of land like so that's just a couple of feet above sea level. That's the isthmus of Catalina Island. From here at the beach, however, in Pacific Palisades, you cannot see that portion of the island. That portion of the island is below the horizon. However, now secondly, let's say that you go up into the hills here in Pacific Palisades behind the school. When you get to the top of those hills, you're at an elevation above sea level of several hundred feet. And then let's say that you look out towards Catalina Island again. When you do, you'll be able to see the entire island. The distance that you are to the horizon depends upon your elevation, for example, above the surface of the earth, say sea level, for example. So now we go to the hills here in Pacific Palisades, draw the situation, and it now looks like this. Okay, when I draw this line right here, this is no longer the horizon, this is now the waterline. Like so. And now you see two hills, like so, of Catalina Island, and you can now see the isthmus, this portion of the island that's only a couple of feet above sea level, well, it's now above the horizon if you look at the island from the hills here in Pacific Palisades. This is now above the horizon. So the existence of the horizon proves that the Earth's surface is not flat. It's proved, it proves rather that it's curved in some manner. But simple observations such as this do not definitively prove that the Earth is spherical. How, in fact, do you prove that the Earth is spherical? Well, that's a little bit more subtle. That then comes from the following. Okay, let me do some erasing here. So just to summarize, however, what I went, went through just a few moments ago, the existence of the horizon proves that the Earth's surface is not flat. What, however, definitively demonstrates that the Earth is a sphere. Well, that's an observation that's a little bit more subtle. In order to understand this observation, we first of all have to get a little bit of perspective. For example, let's say you're standing flat on the surface of the Earth. And then just for the sake of simplicity, let's say that you have a completely flat, featureless horizon around you like so, in all directions. So there are no hills or buildings or anything like that in the way. From your perspective of standing on the surface of the Earth, what does it look like you're standing in the middle of when you look out towards the horizon in every direction like so? It looks as if you're standing in the middle of an enormous circle. This is sometimes referred to as the horizon circle. So now let's get a little bit of perspective here. Okay, what I'm drawing here is a circle that is kind of tipped on its side obliquely. This is referred to, as I said, as the horizon circle. And then let's say we have an observer here standing on the surface of the Earth like so. And then you look at the sky overhead. Geometrically, what does it look like you're standing underneath? It looks like you're standing underneath a hemispherical dome. Like so. 
everything that you see in the sky appears to be on the inside surface of that dome. Okay, now let me cut label here a couple of points on this diagram. First of all, the point straight up. The point straight up is always referred to as the zenith. And then just for now, I'll define this a little bit more carefully later on. For now, let's just assume that off to the left-hand side here on my diagram, this is north, say, and this right here is to the south. And then let's say that this observer who is standing at the surface of the Earth, it's night, let's say, let's say that that observer looks at a star. That star would be on the inside surface of this hemispherical dome. For example, let's say that that star is rather low to the southern horizon. Let's say that it looks, say, something like this. Right here is a star. We measure an angle associated with the position of this star above the horizon. This is sometimes referred to as the altitude angle. The altitude angle would be an angle that is formed in the following way. Point my marker towards the horizon like so, and then look up at the star in this direction. When you do, you form an angle right here. This is referred to as the altitude angle. Okay, now for this diagram, let me label this as the first observer. Because now let's say that we have a second observer, a second observer who is much further to the south of this first observer, say hundreds of miles for the sake of argument. And that person looks at the exact same star at the exact same time. Is that second observer going to see that star at the same altitude angle as the first observer does? No, that person will see a much greater altitude angle associated with that star, assuming that this second observer is much further to the south. So over here on to the side, let me now label this as the second observer who is much further to the south And this person observes the same star at the same time. So what would that person then see? Well, that person would then see the following. Okay, once again, I'm gonna go ahead and draw here the person's horizon circle like so. Here's the observer. Okay, here's the sky overhead, this point right here is the zenith. Once again, let's say that this is to the north, this is to the south. And that person then looks at the exact same star at the exact same time. This person sees it at a greater altitude angle above the horizon. That is like so. This is an observational fact. The only way to explain this observational fact is that the two observers are standing on the surface of an enormous sphere. The only explanation is that the two observers standing on the surface of an enormous sphere. Okay, still, however, how does this observational fact definitively prove that the Earth is spherical? Here's the explanation. Okay, let me go ahead here and draw a spherical Earth, like so. Let me go ahead and label the Earth's equator, say like this. And then we have right here the North Pole and the South Pole, like so. Now, from our vantage point on the Earth, when we look out into the universe, the universe appears as an enormous sphere. The ancient Greeks took this appearance to be a literal interpretation of how the universe is structured. It formed the entire basis of what is called their cosmology, which we'll be getting into later on in this unit. This sphere, if you will, that the Earth appears to be in the center of is referred to as the celestial sphere. We still use the idea of the celestial sphere today, however, because it forms the entire basis, for example, of our navigation. But more than 2,000 years ago, the ancient Greeks took it to be a literal interpretation as to how the universe is structured. 
Now, of course, I cannot draw an infinitely sized sphere here on my diagram. Let me just draw it like so. Okay, so the universe appears as an enormous sphere, essentially of infinite radius. Once again, this is a mere appearance, nothing more, but the ancient Greeks took this to be a literal interpretation as to how the universe is structured. We'll be getting into the idea of the celestial sphere in a little bit more detail as we proceed. For now, however, let's say that we have this star that we're observing, and that star appears as a point on the inside surface of the celestial sphere. Let me go ahead and draw it off to the right-hand side, same like so. Okay, and then we have our two observers. So the first observer, the diagram over here on the left-hand side, is for the observer who is very far to the north. So let me go ahead, and here in black like so, label this person here as our first observer. How do we go from this diagram here to what this observer sees in the sky when the person looks at that star? Well, what we have to do on this diagram is picture this person's horizons. In order to do so, what we would draw is a line, I'll do it as a dotted line in this case, that is tangent to the surface of the Earth, tangent to the sphere at that person's location. That then looks like this. Like so. And then right here on this diagram like so is the dome of the sky, if you will, that the first observer sees here on the diagram on the top board. And then we have the second observer. The second observer is looking at the same star at the exact same time, but remember that the second observer is much further to the south. And I'll use a different color to illustrate. Let's say that that second observer is like so here in red. Okay, and then once again, how do we go from this idea of the celestial sphere, once again, let me label this, by the way, as such. How do we go from this idea of the celestial sphere to the diagram that we see there on the top board for the second observer? Once again, we have the, per we have the picture, rather. now in this case, the second observer's horizons. To do so, we would draw a dotted line that is tangent to the surface of the Earth at that person's location. That then looks like this. Like so. And then the dome of the sky that the second observer would see would be right here on the diagram, like so. That's that diagram there. Notice that for the second observer, that star that we're looking at is at a much greater altitude above this red horizon than it was for the first observer. The star is at a much lesser altitude angle above the black horizon. Once again, this is an observational fact. One of the first cultures to notice this, because essentially they had a large enough geographical empire to do so, is the ancient Greek civilization that started to flourish around 500 BC or so going forwards from there. We will be referencing this ancient Greek civilization as we proceed through this opening unit here on the early history of astronomy. So these observations, these observational facts, they definitively prove that the Earth is spherical. Let me conclude this part one of today's lecture in the following way. Periodically at this point in lecture, students will invariably ask me the following. Why is it then that conspiracy theories involving a flat Earth still persist to this day? The simple answer to that, very simply, is that people are stupid. There are, quite frankly, a lot of stupid people out there that should know better. Those stupid people choose for whatever reason not to believe the observational facts that are right in front of them should they care to look. It's literally as simple as that. People are stupid.